Hello. Thank you very much for attending this lecture. What I want to talk to you about is a question which I think has been very much at the centre of the way in which we think about contemporary politics in Britain, in Europe and in America, which is about how democracy comes and goes, how democracy emerges, but also perhaps more especially in the last few years, how democracy can go away. The idea that democracy is not here forever is a rather recent one in modern Western political thinking. The idea that democracy has a history is one that has been brought home to us by the contemporary debates about, the, about democracy or about the absence of democracy during the Brexit debate in Britain, take back control, during arguments about the power of parliament within Brexit, but also indeed over COVID, about the way in which the Trump administration is seen to be stretching somewhat to the limits the legal and, rep and democratic structures of the United States. And of course, much more broadly across Europe, there are issues about what democracy should look like with the emergence of new populist movements, new right wing movements, which explicitly define themselves against existing models of democracy. So we can depress ourselves very easily about the future prospects of democracy. And therefore, perhaps it's appropriate that I should try to cheer you up by talking a little about the past history of democracy, about the way in which Western Europe became democratic after the Second World War. Now, that seems to me to be really rather Balliol subject to be addressing, because although it may be a subject of general debate, it's also of specific relevance to the modern history, to the contemporary history, shall we say, of Balliol. I think since the Second World War, most Balliol tutors, most Balliol uh, students have thought of themselves as operating within democracy, that democracy is what they're trying to achieve within the college, broadening access, greater responsibilities for students, a change of culture away from a rather hierarchical model. Uh, but it's also what Balliol students then go on to do in the world. They participate as democratic citizens, but many of them also engage in forms of public service and employment in the state sector and so on, which has, almost as its implicit purpose, the broadening and deepening of democracy within contemporary Britain and indeed across the world. So the idea that there is a history of democracy seems a very appropriate one to be raising with you today. Now, the idea that Europe has a democracy is one that, as I say, is relatively recent. The book that I've just written is about the way in which Europe, Western Europe, fell into democracy after the Second World War. The woman in this picture, who's voting in the first elections that women were allowed to vote in, in France after the liberation in 1944, in no sense chose democracy. We have no sense of knowing what it meant very much about her, apart from her evident domestic responsibilities in buying three baguettes for lunch. But on her way home, she is voting and a male figure of authority in a rather splendid suit is standing there making sure that she performs this civic duty in the right way. Now, that idea that democracy was something to be taken seriously and something that had to be administered properly is very characteristic of the way in which democracy emerged after the Second World War. It was a surprise victor of the war. The idea that what would happen after the war was democracy was remarkably little discussed during the war, especially within occupied Europe. There were a whole series of buzzwords among those who were within or without resistance movements. People would talk about freedom, about liberty, about the people, about the nation. They talked very little about democracy. And that perhaps was not entirely surprising because democracy did not have a good reputation. It was the failings of democracy, which in most people's eyes had led to the success of Nazism, of the NSDAP, as a demagogic democratic force in the latter elections of the Weimar Republic during the late 20s and early 30s. It was democracy that was at fault for the arrival of these bandits in power. And in France, it was the Third Republic and the ineffectual parliamentarians who eventually ended up clustered in a casino in Vichy voting full powers to Marshal Pétain, who had proved incapable of fighting the war in 1939 and 1940, 
resulting in the categorical defeat of France, but also its humiliating occupation. Very similar issues could be raised about Italy, the arrival of Mussolini in power, but also about wide areas of Central and Eastern Europe that had abandoned democratic parliamentary regimes during the 1920s and 30s in favour of some form of authoritarianism. So democracy was something of a corpse in Europe around the 1940s, and therefore there is a real historical problem to explain as to why democracy ends up being such a victor of the Second World War in Europe. And it certainly was a victor because the most remarkable feature of Western Europe after the Second World War is the sameness of its political institutions from Norway in the north to Italy in the south, but also their durability. The way in which after a whole series of regime changes in most of these countries over the preceding 100 or 150 years, you arrive at a really rather stable form of democracy in Western Europe which it seems almost incapable of being overthrown. Yes, there is a regime constitutional crisis in France in 1958, which results in the transition from the Fourth to the Fifth Republic. But even that transition is very carefully manufactured and presented as being a continuity of a certain higher legality and democracy, rather than being what it was, which was the humiliating defeat of a democratic regime in the face of a revolt in its departement across the Mediterranean in North Africa. And yes, there was also Eastern Europe that very much espoused a form of people's democracy and very much displayed that in the form of parades and demonstrations and the, the performance of mass acts. But at least from the late 40s onwards, and especially after the Budapest uprising in 1956, the perception that the people's democracies of the East rested not on the will of the people, but on the denial of the will of the people, was a very strong one among most people in Western Europe. So Eastern Europe became the other, which almost served to reinforce the democratic credentials of the West as being the home of the true democracy, being the home of a certain sort of freedom, which proved, rather conveniently, the superiority of the Western way of life. So what I want to do in this lecture is to walk through some of the reasons for this surprising victory of democracy in Western Europe after 1945. And yes, you'll probably be able to notice that in some of the things I'm talking about, there is a distinctly contemporary edge, which might help to inform debates today about how we might fall back into democracy or manage to create some form of new democracy better adapted to the needs of our time. So to begin, in ruins. The perception that Europe was in ruins in 1945 was a very dominant one. It wasn't entirely true. This rather staged photograph of a woman with a few possessions sitting amidst ruins in Cologne in 1945 might be regarded as the defining image of Europe in 1945. And of course, it was true of quite a number of cities across Western and Central Europe, which had experienced not just allied bombing, but also street fighting, and the general abandonment of a structure of predictable life, be it the arrival of water, be it the arrival of money, be it the arrival of bread, or be it participation in a structure of a governed society. So creating a democratic order in 1945 was not just about clearing away this rubble, it was also about bringing back a sense of a hierarchical participation in a new political structure and bringing the people back under the control of the state. That sense that actually the people had escaped from state authority and had perhaps escaped into new forms of political community was very tangible in 1945 and a source of much concern to the rulers, especially to those rulers returning from exile in London around the end of the war, but also a source of concern to many so-called ordinary people in Europe who felt that they had entered a much more uncertain world where problems such as criminality and violence and the simple unpredictability of where their future was going was of a great source of concern. One sees this in this much more powerful image in a way, which is of Italian partisan groups around the end of the war engaging in what they see 
as the enactment of the liberation of their country, but also something more than that. This is about the, the glimpse of a new sort of society. One sees that immediately with the guns. One sees it also with the evident activism of women acting outside of anything that might have approximated to a gendered role in European society in the 1940s. And one sees it also in their youth, because this is a form of street politics, of street action, in which it is the young who are very much to the fore. And it's not difficult to imagine that the spectacle of armed youth on the streets of cities around Europe in 1945 was a source of concern to many other people who weren't entirely sure that these young people were on their side, or still worse, that these young people might have the indecency to ask on which side they had been in previous political and military conflicts. So the project of creating Western Europe's democracy after 1945 was often focused around the ambition to get these people home, to restore a certain predictability and order to European life. So democracy was in no sense an accident in Western Europe after 1945. It was very much a legitimizing tool by rulers who had learnt over the preceding years just how dangerous exercises or authoritarian power could be, but who were also very conscious of the danger of the emergence from below of new forms of local republics, of local communes, of forms of armed bands, of people who put on an armband and then claimed authority. That had to be replaced in the thoughts of people like General de Gaulle by a much more ordered society where it was people in uniform who had been appointed by the state who took control and set about creating a new sort of state and then set about allowing the people into the new palace that they had created. That issue that you had to re-establish state authority before you could introduce democracy was very common to many ways of thinking, not just in France or Italy, but across large areas of Europe after 1945. Order came first, and then out of order, you created a new form of political system. These were lessons learned from previous years, from the spectacle of disorder in Europe in the 1930s. Remember the Spanish Civil War, remember the street fighting in Germany around 1932. But these were also lessons learned from watching wartime Europe from outside, because many of these rulers are returning to Europe, having participated in the quasi-democratic structures of Britain and America during the war years, and who saw themselves as bringing back particularly American models of New Deal activist government into Europe. So this was about creating a, a new form of democracy that was not based around the street popular sovereignty that you see there, but through the formality of process, through law through order, through constitutional structures, and then latterly through the introduction of referenda and then parliamentary elections. But there was a strong sense that democracy shouldn't rest exclusively with the elected representatives. And therefore you had to buttress that with the power of new legal systems, with the actions of new forces of order, the need to create police and army structures that were reliable and that could manage to control, could run ahead of any potential threat to state authority. And then, finally, you allowed people to vote. There is much nervousness in Western Europe after, in 1945 and 1946 about what would happen when you finally allowed people to vote. Well, you see the answer in this photograph. Most obviously, these are women voting for the first time in France and indeed in Italy and in Belgium. Um, but everywhere, there was a sense that you had to have a new civic universalism. Introducing women into the democratic process might have resolved what to our eyes looks like the most blatant, uh, extreme form of inequality in European society. But it was also predominantly a conservative act. This was about bringing in the women in the hope that the women would prove to be the more reliable, trustful, trustworthy um, political citizens. And you see that here. The women are crowding round the officials, also women, but with a man standing there looking over them. They're crowding round, but they're doing so 
in an ordered way. They are not people who are taking power for themselves. This is not 1789. This is not Marianne storming the barricades. This is about citizens participating in an orderly way in the structures of democracy. And I'm very struck by the frequency of images after 1945 of people queuing to vote, of people showing patience, of people going through a ritual of democracy. How they voted was perhaps less important than the fact that they were voting in a particular way. And how they voted, of course, um, did not necessarily uh, determine who sat in Parliament. Part of the fun of Western European democratic systems after 1945 is that on the whole they introduced rather elaborate structures of proportional representation which were principally designed to um, prevent sudden surges in popular support for individual political parties. That after all was a lesson about the Nazis in Germany. You shouldn't let Parliament be overrun by unworthy representatives. So you had to have strict stru structures of proportional representation that um, that reduced the impact of sudden shifts in political fortunes. So these women are voting. I imagine a good number of them for the MRP, the New Catholic Political Party in France, that often um, enjoyed support from new female voters. But it's more important how they are voting than what they are voting for, or indeed what their representatives might go on to do. This is about a new sobriety in democratic process, very different from the spectacle of mass action, from the spectacle of mass rallies, and above all, by, preoccupied by the need to get crowds off the street. Democracy was not about crowds. It was about people voting in an orderly way and then going home in the new ideology of, democ of domesticity to let competent people take charge. And that, too, was part of the new models of democracy or the new ethos of government. You have here a very boring picture, which is intended to be boring. This is an image of the West German government meeting around 1960. The rather famous post-war West German Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, is the person in the foreground with his back to the camera. And of course, he's presiding over a completely uh, anonymous bunch of cabinet ministers. Those who know enough about West German politics in the 60s will be able to identify them. But of course, they are completely interchangeable. They are all in suits. They are all showing a serious purpose. They've all got plenty of papers in front of them. And they've even allowed one woman into the room at the end of the table as a very tangibly junior minister with no doubt responsibility for some gendered area of government action. But these are people who are actually seriously managing the processes of the state. And it doesn't look to me as though they are listening very carefully to the will of the people. Indeed, the fact that they are, in a sense, within a room hidden from public view, I'm sure the photographer was ordered out after he'd taken this photograph, was an indication of the way in which government worked best when it was put into the hands of competent, efficient, administrative people. The professions of those around the table are things you might speculate about, but I suspect that there are plenty of lawyers there. I suspect that there are plenty of accountants there, but there are also, no doubt, within the German technical education system, some engineers, some people who knew how to build things, some people who had plenty of relevant experience. And that sense that government was best done by people who had experience and had a particular expertise was very strong, strong in the ethos of government after 1945. There was no space here for orators, for people who were almost irresistibly popular, people who had a direct bond with the public. After all, you didn't want the direct election of presidents. You wanted a much more indirect structure of administration and government in democracy after 1945. This was, of course, about a machinery of government. And one sees that in these sort of new buildings of government in Europe after 1945. This is a rather sad image because this is the image of the new buildings of the Belgian nation-state created in the so-called city administrative in Brussels in the early 1960s to replace the sort of inherited 19th century government, government buildings that no longer serve per their purpose. They were no longer fit for purpose. These are supposed to be new office blocks where new administrators could run around pushing pieces of paper around, holding meetings and making the decisions. Well, sad, of course, 
is that the Belgian nation state is not really a contemporary reality. The state that this, uh, these buildings were set up uh, to administer have now um, in largely been abandoned because many of the responsibilities of the nation state have been devolved to regional administrations. And if you want to go and find the new administrative buildings in Brussels, well, of course, you have to go about a kilometre up the road to the buildings of the EU. So nothing lasts forever, but this is a very characteristic example of the buildings of democracy in the 1960s. You could find similar ones in Bonn or in Paris. This is about planning, it's about administration, and it's about buildings that are occupied by people who know what they're doing, but who are working quite tangibly at a certain distance from the people. They're receiving the taxation that the uh, new forms of economic growth after the Second World War are creating, but then they're re recycling those taxation revenues in new grand projects of development of the state and of society. And it's that idea of grand projects, of grand projets, as they called them in France in the 1950s and 60s, which is so central to the new ideology of democracy in Western Europe after 1945. Government built its legitimacy among its own officials and parliamentary representatives, but also within the, among the public through the delivery of new benefits to the people. Those benefits are new forms of infrastructure. It's about the provision of new forms of um, schooling, the provision of electricity to, rem to remote areas, the provision of reliable water supplies to urban areas, about the uh, creation of new forms of roads and railways and the like, and also Above all, perhaps the most urgent concern of many Europeans after 1945, housing. This housing estate, built, newly built in Frankfurt around 1959, was part of what was the most tangible achievement of a new West German democracy after 1945, which was the creation of decent housing for the millions of people who didn't have such housing as a consequence of war damage, but also as a consequence of the long-term under-provision of reliable housing in European societies going all the way back to the 19th century. Those apartment blocks, of course, look rather uh, rebarbative to us, but to people at the time, they were in many ways the promised land. There was nothing very wonderful about those apartments. They often had rather poor internal design, very cheap fittings, but what they did was that they provided a reliable, warm, dry home for many people who had wondered whether they would ever see that sort of thing again. And if you look at the car at the bottom of the picture, you have a slight sense here, a hint of the new prosperity that is emerging in Western Europe, at least by the 1960s, when people begin to get involved with motor cars for the first time, or at least male European citizens do. So this new form of democracy was about people actually getting benefits from democratic government. Whether that led people to like their rulers is probably very much open to question. They still saw them on the whole as them, as people who ruled over them, rather than people who were directly responsive to their will. But there is a clear development of a participation in democracy after 1945, in terms of participation in elections, but also in the manifold forms of lobbying, of influencing that people engaged in. People recognised that they had to influence their rulers to resolve grievances such as their uh, family benefits or their pe pension arrangements, or also simply in order to achieve individual benefits, the, er the ability to live in that apartment, the ability to engage in new forms of political structure. That sort of uh, reward culture of, go of government is very much part of the politics of the era, and it creates a rather bottom-up culture of participation in democracy. That did not, of course, mean that all people were equal. And what one sees also in Europe after 1945 is the emergence of the new forms of inequality within democracy. West European democracy was based around rewarding some people more than others. It was certainly not about getting rid of the class divisions, which had for so long been a tangible process, a tangible element of West European society. Instead, it was much more about actually bringing um, those sort of inequalities 
under control and making them more predictable and creating some rules of the game that enable people to all feel that they have their place in society and their place in democracy, an inclusive democracy encouraged by the, by the uh, structures of proportional representation. The reason for moving to this image is because this is very much a symbol of the winners of West European democracy after 1945. The idea of an Abendland Europe, of an evening land Europe, was one pushed very much by Conrad Adenauer, who you see on the left in this photograph, standing next to General de Gaulle, always taller than everybody else on the right. And how astonishing this image is as an image of an allegedly modern new Europe. You have there two sort of democratically elected leaders. Certainly Conrad Adenauer had won elections with his marvellous election slogan of Kaina Experimenten, no, not a, no more experiments. General de Gaulle's claim to a democratic mandate was based on a number of referenda since his return to power in 1958 and on votes in Parliament, but it would be 1965 before he would actually uh, deign to have his, uh, uh, have his rule put in front of the people in the first presidential elections of the Fifth Republic. But these people, these two rulers and all the big crowd who have gathered around them, are in the Cathedral of Reims in eastern France, surrounded by a good number of Catholic clergy and by a military official. And this is a symbol of the new sort of Europe that people wanted to create, or rulers wanted to create after 1945. It's deeply Catholic, it has its military representatives, and its presence in a very old building, the building of a certain sort of Gothic culture, was the expression of this Arbenland Europe, a land of old history, a land of peace, of the reconciliation of the French and German enmity, the, reconcil the resolution of that enmity. Faith, indeed, through the presence of the Catholic Church, which didn't mean everybody was supposed to become a Catholic, but people were supposed to be respectful of things that demanded respect, such as religion. And above all, of course, nobody is cheering, nobody is running around, everybody is impeccably well behaved. This is about the solemnity of the new sort of democracy that was coming into existence in Europe after 1945. And this is built around forms of social inequality. It's built around the importance of a new middle class. A middle class that was much larger than the middle class of preceding eras, because not because everybody had become middle class, but because middle class now became a badge, a club, an aspiration, something which one could move towards, something which one could have as the goal, of the goal for your children through new forms of education. And if you were middle class, you lived in these new sorts of homes with a television, as you can see, a bottle of wine, new furniture. There is nothing there that is old. This is about a new cultural world that's coming into existence. And it's very obvious how West European democracy after 1945 is built around the embedding of middle class interests through new forms of control of access to professions, through deliberately unequal structures of welfare benefits and of pensions that protected middle class lifestyles and prevented middle class people from getting angry and running off to vote for the extreme right. But it wasn't just the middle class who were the benefits of this new form of democracy. So too were rural interests. In 1920s and 30s Europe, it had often been rural Europe, which had provided the most obvious electoral basis of support for parties of the extreme right. That was not the case in Western Europe after 1945. And much of the stability of Europe after 1945 lies in the way in which these sort of rural communities, such as this one in Denmark in the 1960s, could be relied to vote upon to vote for parties of the centre-right, for Christian Democrat parties in some countries, for the Agrarian Party in Denmark. Why would they want to participate in this sort of democracy? Well, because they were being protected too, being protected from the swings of economic pricing that meant that their goods, their crops, achieved a reliable price at market, but also being protected from the impact of world economic changes with the, 
creation of new forms of economic protectionism, a very prominent element of the new structures of the EEC after the Treaty of Rome, the common agricultural policy to protect rural Europe. And the self-image that is going on here of West European democracy after 1945 is about a provincial and rural Europe and the stability of that sort of society and the need for rulers to ensure the stability of that sort of society and ensure that people weren't actually being all swept towards the cities to lead rather unpredictable lives. And one sees that also in the marginalisation of a working class that no longer had as much influence over the way in which Europe might go than it had probably had in the 1930s. Communists, remember, were excluded from government. Trade unions were participants in new forms of economic corporatism, but very much as junior partners. And it's quite remarkable how the industrial working class that had suffered so much during the Great Depression of the 30s and during the social upheavals of the war years is not to the fore in the politics of Western Europe after 1945. People who were, were of course women. And I've already mentioned the, extent, the way in which women were enfranchised in those European states where they had not had the vote previously. It's easy to see this as a false victory for women. Women were enfranchised. They could have the aspiration to buy a hoover, as this poster demonstrates. But they were, of course, also still marginal within many of the structures of political power and were thrust back into a culture of motherhood and of wifehood that could deliberately marginalise them from many areas of economic life and social citizenship. But let's not rush towards too quickly towards the idea that this was about the simple oppression of women. Women were enfranchised. Women were very active in a whole series of women's organisations, consumer groups, in neighbourhood organisations, in about creating societies that worked for them. And they were newly demanding too. They were actually insisting on new forms of health care, education structures for their children, new forms of welfare for their families. This was about often female-headed households taking the key decisions. So this is about creating a new form of female citizenship that worked for women. And let's remember that women were the majority of voters in all European states after 1945, but especially in those states such as West Germany, where a large number of men had been victims of the war. So this is about female majority democracy and about, although, although parliaments may have consisted of a lot of men and Conrad Adenauer's government may have only found room for one female minister, let's not assume that women were powerless in this new form of democracy. Indeed, much of the success of this democracy might lie in the fact that there is a new social contract between rulers and female voters. So what one sees in Western Europe after 1945 is about the emergence of new cultures of citizenship. It was often less political. It was less about demanding things, about going into the streets and actually engaging in, in quasi-revolts. It was much more about a negotiated relationship between citizens and their rulers. So it was about a daily um, negotiation between citizens and the new democratic states that have come into existence. And that creates a new form of democratic identification in Europe. Very few people had chosen to be Democrats in Western Europe after 1945, but it's very striking how, by the 1960s, people thought of themselves as Democrats. Regardless of how they voted, this was the underlying political value structure that they had adopted. And they had adopted it in a new place that was called Western Europe, a term which barely existed in Europe before 1945, but that became an indication of the new sort of world that people had inhabited. A very closely bordered world with the Iron Curtain to the east, with Spain and Portugal still stuck in forms of authoritarian dictatorship in the Mediterranean south, and America still kept at arm's length across the Atlantic. But in this particular almost walled garden of Western Europe, there was now a democratic structure which it was very difficult to imagine ever being overthrown. Yes, of course, in the upheavals in Algeria in 1958, there were various figures on the right in French politics who were imagining some sort of military coup, some form of new authoritarian regime. But where, in truth, was this new form of authoritarianism going to come from? Europe had passed into a new world of democracy, 
and had come to be at home in this sort of domestic, private, informal, well-lit sort of democracy that I suppose was very much symbolised in Britain by Terence Conran, who died earlier this year, and the emergence of a new style of domestic architecture that was very different from the sort of domestic interiors you would have seen in Europe before the Second World War. These are the new interiors of democracy, and it was perhaps the interiors which mattered more than the exteriors. So this was helped by a certain sort of prosperity and helped by a new form of culture that really drew people into a spirit of democratic debate, and it's difficult to resist putting up an image of Isaiah Berlin, who very much symbolised the new spirit of a certain sort of Cold War liberalism. Berlin hated lots of things. He particularly hated Rousseau. Rousseau, for him, was a symbol of the, of the error of modern European political thought in terms of the direct will of the people, the people gathering in town squares and deciding their own future. That had led, and he had seen this, as somebody born Jewish in Eastern Europe, who had moved to Western Europe and eventually to Oxford, he'd seen where that could end up. So you needed to have a particular form of negative freedom, the freedom of the individual to have a certain independence around them, the freedom to engage in rational debate, preferably wearing a suit and with a tie on, and of course men were perhaps better at this than some other people, but you also had to have good academic qualifications because this was supposed to be a new world of reason and of a deliberate new emotional template of democracy, where democracy was about sensitive intellectual debate among people rather than about the rashness of action and of emotion and the drive of people onto the streets. Could that ever work forever? Well, this photograph of Berlin dated to 1968 brings to mind the fact that not everybody in 1968 looked like that or behaved like that. And by 1969, you had many people on the streets. This is a Fiat factory in Turin in 1969, an amazingly large, violent strike at that point. And of course, one could stick up images of Balliol students in 1968, demonstrating outside the American embassy in London against the injustices of the Vietnam War. This demonstrates that societies go through democracy, but they also come out the other side. If by 1968 it was very difficult to imagine Europe falling back into its authoritarian past, or indeed allowing itself to become communist along the, the lines of the Soviet model, the Soviet model of course besieged in 1968 on the streets of Prague by demonstrators in its own way. If it was difficult to see those sort of things coming back, there were now new demands for democracy, for the way in which actually workers should have real power within the authoritarian structures of fiat, of how women should have real power within their social and political lives, campaigns for divorce and above all, I guess, for abortion in this period, very much tangibly indicate the limits of democracy. And to conclude, in many ways, what is very striking about all of this is the way in which actually democracy in Europe had a heyday around the era 1945-1968 and has been engaged subsequently in a somewhat downward trajectory where faith in democratic institutions declines even at the time that people's participation in democracy continues to grow. Colin Crouch once called this post-democracy. The extent to which we are now in democracy, but we're not sure that we really identify with that democracy that exists. And that seems to be a very tangible element of capturing what has been happening in Western Europe or in Europe more generally since 9-11 or since the economic crash in the 2008 and 9 period. There's been a decline in confidence in institutions, a decline in the confidence in rulers, and a decline in the confidence of democracy full stop. There is clearly a dissatisfaction with democracy, which it would be foolish for us to deny. And just because there isn't another ism, another form of political identity which is rushing along to take the place of democracy does not mean that we shouldn't be actually having a very urgent and contemporary debate about how we might be able to create a, democ a new democracy, not the democracy of 1945, but a democracy made anew.
Thank you very much indeed.